Good evening. Thank you so much for being here tonight with us on this gloomy day. It's wonderful to see you all. And I'm thrilled to welcome you for the first event of our Creative Leader Series with Laure Herriard du Bioy. Um, Melissa Seria is our wonderful curator for the series, and she's also going to be moderating uh, the series tonight. For those who don't know Melissa, she has started her career as a journalist. She was the eye editor for Women's World Daily and W Magazine, and then fashion writer at Harper's Bazaar. As a freelancer, she wrote for the New York Times, Vogue, Elle Decor, Departure, and Travel and Leisure. And for us at FIAF, she's been curating now for a number of years the Art de Vivre series of uh, creative leaders. And so this year it features three leading taste makers who are rethinking fashion, design, and style. Next week we will meet with jewelry designer Aurélie Biderman, which I think I saw tonight. So please come back for Aurélie next week. And then on May 16, the architect and designer Thierry Despont. So it's, a, it's really a fantastic lineup, but without further ado for tonight, Melissa will introduce you to Laure Herriard Dubreuil. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. A game-changing retailer and merchandiser, Laure Herriard Dubreuil has channeled her passion for style into a growing number of groundbreaking concept stores, the first of which was launched in 2009, the Webster Miami. It has become a reference for international stylists and editors worldwide, and for the past three years, Laure has held the title of one of the most important people shaping the global fashion industry on the Business of Fashion's annual 500 list. A career in fashion wasn't always the plan, though. Born into the family that owns Rémy Cointreau, Laure was drawn to the complex layers of taste in cognac, France. I actually wanted to be a nose until I was 20, she says. And when the world of perfume proved too slow-paced, she turned to her studies, receiving a degree in Mandarin and economics from the Université Paris-Dauphine before moving to New York to study merchandising at FIT. She honed her curatorial eye and skill for enticing shoppers with Nicolas Guesquier at Balenciaga, and then as the top merchandiser for Yves Saint Laurent ready-to-wear division in Paris. In 2006, a vacation to Miami gave her the inspiration to found the Webster. The energy and location at the gates of Latin America, coupled with a growing audience of international clientele, seemed like a perfect place for a mo new model boutique. Others were more skeptical. Designer Lisa Marie Fernandez told Departures magazine, when the Webster opened, I remember thinking, who the hell is going to buy Margiela in Miami? But law <laughs> has proved everyone wrong. Law's vision now extends far beyond Miami, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, with stores in Houston and a soon-to-be-named location, international partnerships with retailers such as Le Bon Marché in Paris, and designers from Alaya to RS, for whom she is the first ever brand ambassador. And we should add, at a time when the pace of fashion is fast accelerating and traditional retail is experiencing an identity shift, Law says more than ever before, it's really important to create a great store experience. So Law, welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for being here. So creating a great store experience, why don't you start by describing to us what it's like for somebody who is window shopping in Miami and decides to step into the Webster. What are they going to experience? So the Webster, the flagship, the original, is the Art Deco building in the heart of South Beach. And it's a pink and blue building. And you enter, and you have the historical lobby with terrace of floor. So imagine you're outside. It's very warm and hot and humid. And you get in, and it's very cool. And you have the terrazzo floor. And you have the marble bar. And you have the chimney. And you have brass railings. And you start seeing the environment of the Webster with beautiful vintage jewelry box, box 
boxes and then you go downstairs and you have the scent of orange blossom, which is a scent that I developed with the nose in France called Elisabeth de Fedo. And it's a very uh, tropical orange blossom scent. And then you go downstairs, you're in the ground floor, that's where you have the contemporary designers for men's and women's. And everywhere you have vintage wallpapers that I found. So on the ground floor, it's more psychedelic 70s with bright colors. And then you take the elevator that is all in brass and you arrive on the second floor and here you have a thick, warm brown carpet and you have brown walls and you have a velvet large wide sofa where you can you know lounge and enjoy and you can take off your shoes and walk around as if you're in your own uh, home or in your gigantic closet and you can try you know everything and you know and the, everything is displayed everywhere um, it's important for you that people can take off their shoes. Yes. Why yes. is that important? Because I want them to feel very comfortable and I want them to feel in a warm, welcome atmosphere and relaxed and, you know, there the time stops, you know, and they should really enjoy uh, being at the Webster. You said it's important that it's like an apartment. How do you decide where to place things, items in your store? Like I do in my home, <laughs> you know, it's very organic and uh, I like to mix vintage furniture with, uh, you know, uh, designs that I made especially for the stores and everywhere I have art, so I combine, you know, this is very, something very important and with the vintage wallpapers that you would find in your grandmother's house uh, that you have there at the Webster, so, and you have little objects and things uh, everywhere. You're recognized in the industry as being very skilled and, uh, and extremely creative as a merchandiser. Um, before we talk in more detail about your work and about your career, what do you think are the main qualities that make you good at what you do? I think I would say the number one is my eye. I think I have a you know, strong eye and that's what makes the difference. Um, then the second uh, thing is that I'm decisive, which is very important also. Mm -hmm. I have to make lots of decisions very quickly and stick to them. Um, I am true to myself and uh, to my team, which is very, uh, very important. I wouldn't be here without my team. Um, and I would say curious. I think it's an important point. In your early years, you were raised in Cognac, France, where your father helped run the family business. What were your childhood memories of your time around sort of the oak barrels and that production? Were you involved as a child with your siblings? Yes, it's amazing, amazing uh, memories growing up in Cognac and it's, uh, you know, my roots and we're making uh, Cognac, you know, since generations. My mom is here tonight, <laughs> and um, since my grand grandfather, and you know, I have memories with my brothers and sisters, or and with my cousins, you know, running around with the, the barrels, and there's you know some evaporation from the cognac, and it's called the the angel <laughs> share, and we were getting drunk, you know, with the angel <laughs> shares and having a very good time. <laughs> Uh, we've seen from pictures here, and I, the, Law, I have to say, and her team have put together this beautiful slideshow uh, of her life and her career and her sources of inspiration, and really serves as sort of a visual narrative for all of you as we're sort of having this conversation. So we may refer back to it, but it's also a chance for you to actually picture Law's life. Um, but we see some from these pictures that you sort of had an early flair for fashion. What were the earliest signs of your interest in fashion and in, and in business? So, in fashion, I think it was very, very young. Uh, already, uh, already uh, I could make a difference between the clothes and the bon point. You know, I was very into bon point. <laughs> so I knew how to make a difference as a child. And also, I was uh, dressing my brothers and sisters. Um, and then my mom, and then my father, and then everybody in the, in the family. And that's how I, uh, I started my you're job. The, you're the oldest of four. Yes. So you had a right to do that. Yes, yes. I'm the <laughs> eldest. And actually, I think my brothers and sisters were my first employees. <laughs> <laughs> so on that, on that note, who were the people in your life who supported those interests and that vision early on? 
My family has been extremely uh, supportive. Uh, my father has been uh, very supportive, and especially for the entrepreneurship and the business side of it. He doesn't know anything about fashion, but it's more the woman in my family that mo know more about fashion. And from my mom, my grandmother, my aunt on my, my father's side, so, you know, and my godmother. My godmother was Brazilian, was very a big uh, inspiration And I for think me. she's yes, featured she's, here yes, as well, yes. right? Um, Lo, you decide not to become a nose. You decide that it's not fast-paced enough for you. It takes how many years to make a fragrance? Between, you know, three years, four years. And that was just not acceptable to no. you? No. <laughs> <laughs> but now it's biting me back, you know. <laughs> um, you, you go and work for Nicolas Gessier. That's your first uh, sort of job. How did you first meet him, and what was your impression of him? You know, I actually met him on the second day of an internship uh, I did in New York. And we ended up in the elevator together and we started walking in the streets. And uh, I knew not much about fashion, apart just from my own instincts. Uh, but before I had learned Mandarin and economics and I had nothing to do with fashion. And he decided to, you know, that he was going to hire me. Uh, years after, but this was, you know, our first, uh, you know, conversations. And then years after, I was working for him, and it was, you know, the night before a fashion show, and we were waiting for a dress to be made. And then Nicola started saying in front of the entire studio, I'm going to tell you the story how I met Laura. And he just remembered exactly our conversation that we had that day, when I was very green, I didn't know anything, and <laughs> when I was very natural. Do you remember sort of your first impression of him, what his personality was like? You know, it's, he's, very, he's very, very strong. Somebody that uh, is true to himself and he knows uh, where he's going and is making you go there. Patricia. What were you doing there in your first job? What was your responsibility? That was very, you know, like it was a, a, an extremely uh, interesting experience because I was very young and I was part of the creative studio, but I was not designing. And so I was doing everything that had to do around it from, you know, like the creating the labels for the, the clothes to the hangers to the stores to, you know, like being at three o'clock in the morning at a car, uh, um, a car wash place to have some chains, you know, like wash for a show to be sewn after. I mean, it was 360 degrees, but it taught me so much because I had so much responsibilities at such a young age and he, he trusted me uh, a lot. What did you learn from there that still sticks with you today? You know, I think like hard work for sure, and um, like I said, you know, to be, to be really listening to your guts and sticking to it, you know, even though people are trying to push you around and going many places, you continue the way you've decided, and of course with your team. You then go on um, to uh, become the top merchandiser at Yves Saint Laurent's Women's Ready to Wear. Um, just tell us how old you were when you had that job. 28. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was photocopying. And, um, and so you go on to take this big position, which uh, involves a lot more responsibility. Um, you were more of a link, I believe, between the creative studio and even stores across the world. So suddenly you have a broader international experience. What do you see in that job? It was very interesting because uh, when I was at Balenciaga, I was very I was working with the creative team, with the creative studio, which was incredible. And then at Saint Laurent, it, I was the link between the creative studio and all the stores worldwide, and the retail stores, but also the wholesale team. So I, I saw the different markets between the United States and the East Coast or the West Coast and Asia, from China to Japan and uh, Europe, and I had to manage the, the, to work with the creative team to adapt the collections for the different markets without um, losing the DNA, without you know, um, making it still relevant. And vice versa, I was you know, um, spreading the word and, and translating the, the collections to the different markets. So that was very interesting. You clearly had a future there. You could have stayed in Paris. Yes. But you take a trip to yes. Miami. What happened? 
I fell in love actually with the weather. <laughs> Not like today in New York, <laughs> with the sunshine and the palm trees. And um, actually I went for Art Basel, which is the contemporary art fair beginning of December. And um, I, had, I, I, I didn't decide, I was in New York for work and some friends told me to come to Miami. And so I had nothing to, work because, to wear because it was snowing uh, in uh, New York. And I was looking for an outfit for Art Basel and there was, uh, you know, no place to shop. And even in the, in the shops from the, the fashion brands, they had very classical assortment, classic assortments. And so I saw this amazing crowd and, you know, all the developments that were happening in Miami and they, were nowhere, they had nowhere to, uh, to shop. And I loved the weather <laughs> and the Art Deco, uh, you know, architecture, which is unique in the world. So where some people would have thought there's really not what much for what I'm looking for here, you thought there's a huge opportunity. Yes. But at the beginning, when I was going to see the brands and, you know, everybody were like, they had the idea of Miami that was either extremely tacky and cheesy or for old people only. So people were looking at me with like big eyes, you know, what are you doing in Miami? And then I think, you know, we put Miami back on the fashion map, that's for sure. You know, um, some stores like, uh, like uh, Lanvin, for example, opened their first store after Paris in Miami, uh, thanks to the Webster, because Albert was one of the first ones, you know, even in, in our temporary stores, uh, making a silhouette on a mannequin, because <laughs> he felt at home. And that's, that's what's so important with the Webster. Did he take his shoes off? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> but he, he was almost as if. Um, you're clearly not afraid of taking risks. You, uh, you opened the Webster um, during the recession. Uh, it's a time not only, um, you know, you decide to open a completely uh, new concept store. Uh, the retail sector has been sort of brutally hit by the financial crisis. Um, you know, what's, what was going through on in your mind that you decided, let's just do this? So first, I didn't know that the recession was going to uh, appear, arrive. <laughs> <laughs> and the renovations took so long, you know, of the flagship. So everything was delayed. So I had temporary stores before. And then, you know, I had to continue even if the whole world was collapsing. So it was very hard and I really thought I was going to close <laughs> a few days. <laughs> but at the end, you know, I, I stuck to my guts and I stuck to, you know, what I thought and I could feel that we had something and it was going to, to happen. And thanks to Art Basel and the support that we had from this wonderful clientele that spread the word and then the support from the press and the support from the brands, you know, uh, that were very, um, you know, that remained very uh, faithful to us and everything. And that's, you know, and then it went on from there. How long did it take you to start getting recognized? It was actually very fast, uh, thanks to what I just said. You know, it was uh, you know, my it was very, we were very, very lucky. Part of your success, as you said, stems from this deep relationship um, that you've developed with designers and design houses, and we're going to get to that. I just want people to get a sense of what your life is like managing the Webster. Um, how many weeks a year are you on the road um, viewing shows and collections? Every month of the year, except April, uh, August, and November. Apart from that, I mean Fashion Week. <laughs> so walk us a little bit through sort of what that schedule is like. You are touring the world. You are visiting designers, studios. Products. Yes. So you have the you know you have some uh, some uh, fashion houses have up to uh, six collections, uh, and then for for a woman, for example, and then uh, two or four for uh, for men. So when you add the, the two, and so you have the spring, summer, and fall, winter, and then you have the pre-fall and the cruise collections or resorts. And um, you have the fashion shows, that are usually like about a week, and then we have 10 days of buying uh, after. But we have to do it very quickly, actually, uh, uh, after the, the shows. Did you know that your life was going to involve that much time on the road? 
Not that much because I feel that also like we it's getting more and more there's more collections and we have more designers and also like between you have the fashion weeks also in uh, New York, Paris, London and Milan but now you have fashion weeks you know in other places so it makes it even uh, 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 longer and bigger more travels. You have this very good eye and you're very decisive so those two together sort of makes her a winning combo I think but um you select the clothes each season that you are going to uh, include into your stores. Walk us through the process from your perspective of um, how that decision making takes place. When you walk into a room with a collection, how do you pick? How do you decide what you want? And what other pieces are in your mind as you're putting those collections together? So I, you know, like it's a, it's a tough process because I see many brands, you know, in a very short um, period of time with many collections. So <clears throat> I have to scan the, the collection and you have the pieces that you see on the runways, but you have also additional pieces in the showroom. So I have to scan and I have to uh, remember everything that I bought, you know, from either the season just before that will be in the store at the same time or with the other brands. So it's, and I have to imagine everything in the store all together. So and I'm already making looks <laughs> also uh, at the same time. Do you sketch? Do you have notebooks? No, so some, some places we can take pictures, some other places we can't. So it's, it's uh, difficult also because you have to, to remember. And then, um, and then you have line sheets from, uh, from uh, the brands. But I imagine already everything that will happen in the store afterwards. So you're and already it's like oh, about, about the looks also and how you put the pieces together because I don't, I usually don't um, uh, style the, the looks the way they, were, they are styled by the houses and I don't do full looks with the same designers, I mix all the designers together, which makes a big difference in the merchandising and the visual merchandising in the store is that all the brands are mixed together. So what you're suggesting to your client is really your style. Exactly, exactly. And so in your mind, uh, you may be in a, in sort of at a Balenciaga collection, but you're already <laughs> seeing a pair of pants that you would pair with a sweater from another designer. That's how you see it. Exactly. Um, do you work within or beyond seasonal trends? I don't follow. I mean, it's, I think it's kind of maybe unconsciously because you see it, uh, you know, like in many places, but I don't really follow the trends. For me, it's very important to have timeless pieces at the Webster, and I wear timeless pieces. And I love, you know, to wear over and over again, you know, the, the pieces in my wardrobe. And I think that's super important for our clients and the way also we sell to, uh, you know, the way our, um, you know, sales team sells to our clients is really to wear over and over and again. And the biggest compliment for me is when, you know, your daughter or your sons, you know, are wearing your, the pieces, you know, like it's, uh, it's uh, very important for me. Do the trends even influence you? Maybe unconsciously, but that's not, I look more into the DNA of the brands, mm -hmm. you know, and the DNA of the collection. That's the most important for me. I don't look, I don't go for a trend and then try to find it in the brands. I start more with the collection itself and the designers. And it's more, I like, I like to see the difference between the designers instead of trying to follow a trend amongst all of them. I like, to, I like them to be very different from each other. You've talked a lot about the importance of having fashion allow women to dream. Can you tell us a little bit about that? For me, it's very important. It's very important to, uh, to like, you should dream about fashion. You should dream about, you know, like, we don't need clothes. <laughs> so you need to fantasize about a new jacket or you need to fantasize about a new dress. So you need to, you know, like, want and desire. And it's part of, you know, like, the whole glamour 
about fashion and I think uh, and I think that's why I'm like not so much into the fast fashion I'm more into you know slower pace that's when that's why when you get inside the website you take off your shoes because you're relaxing and you're taking your time and then you're you know going to pick up some pieces that you will wear for a very long time and enjoy for a very long time for many women and um, and I suppose men but maybe I'm speaking from my own perspective <laughs> Shopping is also an aspirational uh, sort of exercise. You, you, you choose something, you put it on, and you know that you can step into being something that you dream about. Um, it could be for your work, it could be evening wear, um, but it kind of <coughs> elevates you. Um, how do you support that? How do your um, assistants, sales assistants in your store, for example, how do you train them to be psychologically sort of in tune, I would ask, about what women are looking for? You know, it's um, you, like I, I don't want to push for any uh, silhouettes or any particular dress. You know, uh, for me, I have an example. When I, during my studies, I was a sales associate in a store in, in Paris. And uh, one day, a woman arrived and she was looking for a dress for the Cannes Film Festival. And I ended up selling her five pair of pants and two sweaters because <laughs> no dresses were good, look good on her. You know, and, and she wasn't comfortable, and you know it didn't work. So, you know, like I wouldn't sell her a dress because I didn't, you know, I don't think it was for her. But the pants look good on her, and the sweaters. And then the biggest compliment is that five days after I was at the Cannes Festival myself, and her boyfriend came to me and said, you know, you don't understand how you change her life. She was very depressed that day and you know like she was so happy with the pants that she bought and everything you know and that's what's very important for me is that when you leave the Webster you're happy about and you feel good you know you're comfortable and you know you want you know the people around you to you know think that you look great and you feel confident and that's that's what counts and if you don't find anything you don't find anything so the behind the scenes conversation that's actually happening, if I come in and say, I'm looking for a dress, and you're thinking, no, you're not. No, <laughs> exactly, okay. exactly. But then I'll sell you jewelry. <laughs> and how do you turn that sale around? Because it's not an easy thing to do. To redirect well, because somebody. you don't have it, you know, it's not a goal, you know, you don't set yourself, oh, you know, like, it's more by talking and learning more about the person and, you know, like, having some kind of intimacy for the time being, you know, in the store and really listening, listening to not only what the person is saying, but also the gestures and, you know, what... Uh, what you can understand and feel and the feeling and not imposing or just following, okay, I need a dress, so I need to find you a dress. Yes, of course, I will look for a dress, but if it doesn't work out, you know, my, maybe some other things will work for you. As you develop uh, your stores, do you plan on introducing more technology into your stores, into dressing rooms, or do you still feel that the, uh, the personal touch, that kind of human connection is uh, is still the sort of focus point of customer experience? For me, the human touch is very important. It's extremely important, and that's what makes the, the difference. Also, like for us uh, at the web store, the, the way we style uh, the pieces together, the way we mix the, the collections, the, make, the way we mix the designers is unique. So we need the human touch, you know, no computer can, can achieve that. And actually we're launching our e-commerce right now and we're working a lot on providing this even through our own uh, e-commerce. Can you give a few examples of how, because it is challenging, how through an e-commerce platform you can still communicate your voice, your voice law, uh, your team's voice, in sort of with that uh, customer. Where are the areas that that can happen? Is it through language? Is it through customer follow-up? Uh, how, how do you sort of introduce that? I think the customer follow-up and the customer service is key, for sure. 
uh, it's extremely important. But also for me, it's um, how you know you can uh, um, help with how you pair the things together. More like on the stylism kind of advice, how you mix the, the collections together. This is very important. That's how you, how you create your own wardrobe that is very special and specific to you, not just for uh, anyone. Yeah. And where is technology helpful? For example, if I were to have an app, like, would you ever think about a styling app, for example? And then I would come in and I'd say, hey, I'd love to buy these pieces. Yes, for sure. Uh, well, as long as you can make it very personal. Yeah. But I, I like also, um, you know, like all the improvements that have been made for uh, to be able to shop editorials. I think this is also very good because I think editorials make you dream. So to be able to uh, to uh, buy into that dream, this is uh, this is so very creating good. stories. Yes, um, and you think that that's still important, right? Yes, it's nice to hear. Um, we've talked a little bit about how the cycles of fashion are changing, and recently there's been a lot of talk around the introduction of seasonless collections. Um, shifting to a sort of see now, buy now model where brands would actually make their collections available for sale right after the shows. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're observing in this space? Right now, it's a little bit crazy, I have to say, and even for the clients to understand because they see so much of what's going on in the runways and you even have people wearing the collections so much in advance, uh, already going to the fashion shows, they're wearing samples and everything. So that now we have clients coming to the store with the pictures you know, from Instagram and wanting to buy it now when actually it's going to arrive six months after. And by then, several other collections, they would have seen so much more so it, it there's a part of the dream that is you know missing you know and then even when you buy a piece and then you have you know like so many other collections right after you know and it's a little bit confusing because some so some uh, fashion houses are trying to uh, adapt and are doing fashion shows that are you you know uh, you see it now and you can buy it the next day or you, it's in the store at the same time which is wonderful but it's easier when you only have your own retail stores because when you have a lot of wholesale it's very difficult when you're a younger brand it's not easy either because you know uh, you, how you contact new clients and everything, how you develop your business. So uh, I think we could move into uh, uh, showing the fashion shows and then being in the stores the next day, which would be wonderful, but then we would have you know, to be uh, showing to the industry only six months in advance with no pictures, no, you know, like signing, you know, secrecy and everything. <laughs> it, will, it, would, it, would have, it would be like that, you know, to make sure that nothing leaks. Uh, but then everybody would have to be the same. So right now we're like in between waters and we'll see how it will evolve. But it will be a huge shift if uh, everybody goes that way. But it's very tough. Was it a change that you had anticipated? Could you see it happening and coming? No, I think it's a change that has to do with uh, social media. You do? A lot. Yes. Being able to see things and see yes. have people having access to clothes that are already even dressed in the collection at the shows. Exactly. Um, and it's obviously brought a lot of attention to new customers, I'm sure built your audience or your customer base as well. But the flip side is that now the cycle is speeding up. Yes. And our customers' expectations, um, what's driving this as well? Do they want what's new now? Some of them, but I feel not so much uh, uh, at the Webster because that's not our spirit and that's not the way we select the collections. And, uh, and really, like I said, you know, we're, it's very important to uh, you know, sell pieces that are timeless and looks that are timeless and versatile and that you can mix and match and wear several times. You know. So it, we're more on the longe longevity uh, of things. I'd love to talk a little bit about the impact that this is also having on creative cycles. I mean, we see designers today that are being asked to produce collection after collection, more and more of them, faster and faster. Um, how can you be creative in that kind of environment? Do you have time? Does one have time to think? Um, what, is, what are you observing? 
It's, de it's definitely a, a big challenge. I think uh, uh, the pressure and uh, I w you know, like, it would be amazing if we suddenly decide <laughs> to reduce the amount of uh, collections. But at the same time, it creates some newness in the stores, you know, so it's uh, always, you know, like uh, refreshing. Uh, the thing, I think the key is for the designers to have a good, a good team and to be, uh, to be working, you know, with a good team and so that they can have some time to get some inspiration, some, uh, some breaks. I would imagine it makes tenure difficult, right? If you're, if you're a designer to hold on to that, that tempo for so long um, as designers are moving around more frequently now between fashion houses, um, you know, could the cycle be sort of responsible for that a little bit as, you know, they're just trying to um, meet so much demand? Yes, but then it's saturated also in the stores at the end. I think, you know, like we, there was so much demand, so much demand, and then now it's uh, some kind of a vicious circle. And uh, even, you know, like uh, the department stores are suffering from it. And so it's, uh, you know, but we would have to decide all together. You need like a <laughs> this is the cat. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're also a strong believer in partnerships in fashion between creative and business. Um, you've witnessed some over your career of very successful partnerships. Um, do you think that for uh, designers today, having that right-hand person that you build a brand with is really essential? Yes, definitely. It's about, uh, the, the, t the team is key, you know, to, have, uh, to be able to, uh, to be successful uh, and you have to complete uh, each other. This is definitely, uh, you have the, you know, like the creative part and the business part is very important. Beyond everything that you do, I know that you're also married and you have a young child. You also um, are able to use this as a platform for, uh, for philanthropy. And you've been involved with Mothers to Mothers, which has been highlighted here. Um, tell us a little bit how you got involved and why this was important to you. So Mothers to Mothers is very important for me. It's an association that is uh, based on women and it's uh, the, the, these mothers that are making uh, the work, this association working. It's to uh, help um, HIV positive mothers not to transmit the virus to their uh, child while they're pregnant and for the first few years of the child, uh, child's life. And uh, actually it's the mothers that are HIV positive that are uh, uh, teaching the other mothers and that's right. how the whole system is based. And now some um, countries in Africa are uh, using this system in, for their own um, uh, national medical uh, system because it's so efficient. Uh, and so um, it's, a, it's a charity that is very dear to, uh, to my heart and uh, I uh, am working with them and I want to do more projects to uh, raise uh, awareness and some funds for them. We're going to turn this over to the audience um, because I'm sure that there are a lot of questions for you. You obviously work both in your, in your career but also in your philanthropy sort of at a on a global level. You're very in tune with what's happening in terms of shifts. Um, between cultures. Um, we spoke a little earlier about um, how this landscape is changing. For your customer base, who was your big customer? Um, where were they coming from? I would guess, I, which countries were they coming from? And how has the economy sort of shifted that? And where do you see it going in the next few years? So in Miami, um, it, we have a very international clientele. And uh, we have uh, we had a lot of resilience, and it's true. These uh, you know past uh, uh, months, uh, we have seen less Brazilians, and also we had uh, uh, some Russians, and we see less Russians. But for example, we see more Africans coming, and now we're starting some a to see some Asians, which we didn't have um, before. Uh, in the past, and also we, we, we haven't talked about Houston, but uh, I recently opened a, a store in Houston in Texas, and uh, over there it's more uh, local clientele, but also there's Mexicans and Middle Eastern coming, so it's uh, a lot of uh, international clientele. You opened Houston, it's a similar sort of cli uh, climate a little bit to Miami as well, um, yes. so you can buy for both stores in similar ways or not even? 
Yes, no matter what, it's the same uh, DNA uh, for the Webster. And you know, when at the beginning, when I first opened Miami, and you know, I was going to the showrooms, and the brands were telling me, "Oh, you should take this bag because this is so Miami with rhinestones and you know, gold <laughs> everywhere." And meanwhile, like this would never work at the Webster. Or like you said, you know, we would have thought that we would sell you know Margiela uh, in Miami. So. At the end, I, we stuck to, to what the Webster is about and the Webster DNA, and, and it's really what we pick, what we like. You know, I like every single piece that is inside the Webster, and I would wear it, or the people around me would, uh, would wear them, and that's what's the most important. When we try to cater too much to what we think or like the image of what people in Houston or Texan women would wear, you know, it's not what they want to wear. <laughs> <laughs> in talking about Houston, you were involved in sort of locating where your store was going to be. Um, you also got involved in discussions that I think you are really interested in, which is urban development, where, how things are going to start to be shaped in cities. And people actually ask you for your opinion in terms of saying, what should we place here next to your store? What do you think would work? Is that because your merchandising skills give you a flair for what sells even beyond the borders of your own stores? I think what, it, what is um, wonderful about the Webster and it's the, you know, the relationships that I have with all the brands and all the designers and the fact that we see so much of what's going on and we are aware of you know so much that it gives us a clear vision of uh, you know how how the market is evolving and you know how and that's why for me and, it, and now it's it's uh, wonderful to be able to talk with some developers that would be interested in having the Webster coming you know in a new area or a, a new city or, or a city where they're developing something is that it you know, it's, it's good to have the Webster surrounded by, uh, you know, an environment of different stores and, and it's, um, it's very interesting. It's like Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that you have big uh, plans for the Webster. Can you tell us a little bit where you see it five years from now? <coughs> I, I always wanted to open more Webster uh, since the flagship because a big difference between my store or other multi-brand stores is that I had no link or no relationship with Miami. I literally arrived with my little suitcases, you know, from France. I didn't know one person in Miami when I started, which makes it easier to open the, the Webster in other cities. So now, so I have two stores in Miami and now I have one in Houston. I want to open other ones. I want to open in the, on the West Coast. I want to open maybe um, uh, also, uh, you know, uh, one day for sure in New York, but uh, I don't want to open too many, you know, and, and for now, like mostly in the United States, but why not, why not one day internationally, why not? one day in China, you know, going back to my roots of learning Mandarin, Mandarin. for eight years. <laughs> for those people in the audience that may be interested in sort of understanding um, what they would need to start sort of, a, um, sort of a very robust business like you have, what advice would you give? To be true to yourself and, um, uh, you know, like, listen to, to what you have inside and what you, follow your dream, follow your passion and uh, uh, surround yourself with a good team. Some of them are here tonight. Yes. Do you want to raise your hands? I'd love to see who's from the team here. There or there. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions for Law, and I'd like you, there are mics that, and we can have this as a conversation, it's informal, so please don't hesitate, raise your hands. I know that there are, Ginger back there has also worked as a merchandiser. There are people here who, who know the industry well, and I'd love to hear from, from all of you a little bit about sort of this changing landscape. First question, I love what you're wearing. Who is the designer? <laughs> this is Gucci. Okay. <laughs> is, is this this year, this season? Yes. Okay. Secondly, you have a great taste. Are you, are you planning to, at some point, have your own line? This is something that I'm definitely thinking about, yes. So I, that's, a, that's a good springboard for, for also just touching base about these collections that you develop with designers. 
Um, I, my guess is that you're pretty much, you're pretty hands on, right? When you go in and you do exclusive sort of partnerships and, and collections, how does that work? Yes, uh, the, I do, you know, I do very regularly with, you know, all the designers that I carry at the Webster. I always select pieces and work with them. And I think it comes from my experience. At first, before all, I'm a merchandiser. And that's, you know, my experience working with the design team uh, at uh, Balenciaga or Saint Laurent. You know, I really know how to work with them. So that's what I do on a daily basis with the designers that we carry at the Webster. But then I did also some bigger projects, like, for example, with Target, which for me was the American dream. <laughs> it was on a different scale with, uh, you know, more than a thousand stores and a collection of 250 pieces for men and women and children. And uh, this was a one-year project, and this was incredible because uh, I designed, you know, so many uh, different uh, pieces from ready-to-wear to shoes to uh, uh, bags and jewelry. But also, I did um, a capsule collection with Eres. And, uh, for whom you're the ambassador. Yeah, exactly. What does that mean to be an ambassador for a bathing suit company? It's being on the beach all the time. <laughs> <laughs> And swimming in nice bathing suits. <laughs> it's a brand uh, that I've been very uh, supportive, uh, actually very uh, uh, genuinely and organically. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, from you know, uh, stealing my mom's uh, you know, heiress bathing suits um, to uh, you know, earning my first. And that's the thing, you know, about dreaming. You know, I was dreaming about heiress. I'm still dreaming about it. You know, it's. Uh, I think it's very, uh, very important. So I designed the capsule with them. And I did also a great project with Le Bon Marché. I designed a, a collection. It was uh, the, a white collection uh, because the founder of Le Bon Marché created the Le Mois du Blanc in January in Paris. So we decided to uh, bring the Miami uh, white heat uh, and do a white collection with more than 60 designers, including Chanel and, uh, and Céline and Givenchy. And, uh, and also younger designers for, uh, for Le Bon Marché. So that was a, a great project also. So you're really able to style even beyond the Webster? Yes. In projects like that? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for a very inspiring conversation. And I think the impact that you're bringing human touch to retail again which we miss every day when we go shopping because people look at us as a target, not as people. And I think the impact of what you're communicating here is you're bringing who you are to that platform. How do you manage to translate that charisma, storytelling, human curiosity to your team? It's a very good question. <laughs> you should ask them. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, the, we, we call ourselves as the Webster family. And, uh, and I think, and, uh, you know, I was uh, always called uh, the Webster my baby. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and it's, um, we have a very close relationship. And, you know, we are all growing with the Webster. Um, and I think it's um, the way also we, we are... Um, you know, um, you know, the way we are hiring the people, you know, that it's people that are very sensitive to that message, sensitive to uh, our, um, you know, brand identity and who we are and what we want to transmit. And, and I think also you have to be, all of them have to be true to themselves, you know, to be able to relay the message uh, to the clients and so be genuine. They, they dress how they wish, is that correct? Yes. So that's an interesting point. So do you want to just mention a little bit the, the, the sort of how you encourage that even within your, your team? We encourage the, the personalities a lot uh, and for, for everybody to you know, uh, express themselves uh, differently and, uh, and to work together uh, uh, as a team. But they all, they all really embrace the, the spirit and that's, uh, that's the most important. Thank you very much for the speaking. Uh, so I have uh, two questions actually. One is uh, since you talk like uh, you talk about uh, you're really excited about the projects with targets and also the other one like Loop Bomb Machine. So I just wonder, uh, have you ever thought about designing uh, your own brand maybe in the future? 
Yes, yes, that's uh, uh, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so how you know at the yeah. beginning, uh, people were asking me, and the, the clients of the website were asking me uh, since uh, since the the beginning. And at the beginning, I was telling them, "You're crazy, you know. <laughs> There's too many brands already, and I receive hundreds of emails of designers um, per day. And who would want another brand uh, on the market?" And then slowly. Uh, I'm growing into it, so yes, maybe one day I will launch my own. So, like, how do you uh, feel that your brand's DNA would be like? If yeah, it, I'd like yeah, to know right? that too. What would you? Uh, it would be very, very close to my own, <laughs> to my own DNA. Um, and uh, you know, like, I don't want to do anything revolutionary, and I'm not a designer per se, I'm a merchandiser, so it will be more brand of, done by a merchandiser and more uh, something, you know, really in connection with, you know, my clients and, you know, and the, you know, from having been, you know, at the Webster and the store and understanding and having seen, you know, all the different markets and all the different brands. So it's more something that would speak directly to uh, the the woman and to uh, to my clients and maybe men's after one day I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sure it will be very successful. Uh, and also I have another question uh, that you talk about. Maybe you are going to open a store in China. So I come from China. I just wonder, like, if you want to open, ever want to open a store in China, uh, what will be the business perspective? Or what do you think that would be like a demonstration about how uh, the Websters or the other uh, like uh, eyes from you, or that would be more related to the business of the Chinese girls or whatever? So I just wonder, what do you think about that? You know, I think it would be it needs to be very organic, uh, uh, which is the way uh, I've done it. Uh, you know, like for example, opening in Houston. I opened in Houston because I had clients that are actually uh, collectors of uh, uh, contemporary art that were coming for uh, Art Basel in Miami and they were shopping at the Webster and then they were asking me because they had no place like that to shop uh, over there. So I, they invited me, I went, you know, I became friends with them. and So everything has to have a reason. Nothing is done just on a business uh, level and I think that goes back to also your question. That's what makes it very genuine and organic because it's and it's the same with buying the collections. You know, I go with my instinct, I go with my guts, I go with what I really like, and it's not because people are telling me, oh, this is the new eat bag or this is the new eat brand. You know. I don't really care about that. I care about do I like it? Do I want to wear it? You know, I, you know, am I gonna enjoy it? Am I gonna be happy seeing it at the store? So it's the same. I'm talking about China right now. Nothing is, but it's because I spent a lot of time there. You know, when I was younger, it was like a, another part of my life, and I loved it and really, really enjoy it. And uh, so, you know, it would make sense for me one day. You know, why not? But it would have to be very organic and natural and still be very close to what the Webster is and not, you know, uh, diluting the just for a business uh, perspective. Before we wrap up, is there one more question for Law? Yes. You talked a lot about sticking to your DNA, being authentic or organic and Oh, we have a picture of this in, in, in the slideshow, but I would love to hear in words how you defined your DNA. That's uh, <laughs> another session, you know, maybe like we need another hour. Uh, I, think, I think my DNA is all of this. I think my, my, my DNA is sunshine on a rainy day. Um, it's, um, you know, it's, um, I don't know how to describe it uh, in a few words, but for sure it's, uh, it's uh, and it's, if, it, if you're talking more about the, um, yeah, it's warmth, it's sunshine, it's colors, it's, um, it's um, luxurious, it's quality. 
um, it's uh, about you know like the the, the fabrics, the, the cuts, but it's uh, it needs to be very original and very uh, different in a way, but at the same time timeless. Thank you for that question. Seems to me, it's very happy. Yes. Yes. The Definitely very happy. <laughs> it needs to be happy. And I want people to be happy at the Webster, in it, you know, the people working there, but also the people just visiting. So thank you for that question, and thank you for joining us tonight. Laure, many thanks. Thank you.